you. Hi, I'd just like to welcome everybody to our online version of Can I Trust My Clock? Why NTP is a Fail. It's um, great to have you all with us for this really interesting and informative talk. And I hope you will uh, enjoy it as much as we did at the at the uh, in-person version we had a few weeks ago in Melbourne. Um, so welcome. Yep. <laughs> Couple of housekeeping notes. We will be sending out a feedback survey to all registered attendees this afternoon and, and anybody who responds will automatically enter our prize draw. What we want to know it, from you is uh, what other ways we can improve these sessions, other topics you'd like to hear, uh, if or even if you have a, a project you want to tell us about, any member demos or prezos, we're really keen to have, uh, or maybe even some peering socials. Perhaps it would be time for us to do a peering social online. Either way, let us know <laughs> and do that via the survey. There's some great, uh, great swag that we will send out in re response to filling out the survey, folks. So please get in the draw and uh, let us know about it. Um, Another thing I need to remind you all of is that the board adopted a code of conduct for our events. Basically, be respectful to each other, um, be supportive and assist each other in participating in these events so that we can have a, a great, really productive, interesting time that, that everybody values. If anybody does become annoying, well, overly annoying and ob 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 obstreperous or insulting, et cetera, within the... Uh, Within the sessions, we will we will kick people out. Uh, you can appeal, but we won't readmit you on the day. Either way, basically be nice, and all will be good. So I'd also like to remind you of our upcoming events. New South Wales IX turns ten this year. Isn't that incredible? And it's our biggest IX around. The traffic on there is um, continues to grow. So on the twenty first of June in Sydney. Around about 5.30 p.m., we will be having a little party to celebrate that. So that'll be an informal. You're hearing about it first here, folks, so please come along and enjoy that. Uh, and then both in Canberra and Sydney, we'll be having joint events with APNIC where they run their RPKI ROA tutorial. So there's some really helpful things to learn from that. Uh, they've already run that training in uh, Adelaide and Melbourne, and I think people got a lot of value out of it. So please, if you haven't in implemented RPKI or even you just want to make sure you're doing it properly, come along and you'll really enjoy those. And we'll have a social afterwards at, at both of those. Um, yep, the way we're doing it is that corporate members can register up to eight guests to any of these sessions and professional members can, can bring one guest along. So take advantage of all of that, please, folks. Okay, I need to introduce Daryl Veach to you. Daryl did a BSc with honours at Monash Uni uh, and a mathematics PhD at Cambridge. Uh, he's worked at, at Telstra Research Laboratories, uh, CNET in France, Tel for France Telecom, um, KTH in Stockholm. I'm not familiar with that one. Daryl, you have to fill me in on it later. <laughs> INRIA in France, Belcor in New Jersey, of course, RMIT, uh, Sprint Labs, Technicolor Paris, EMU Lab, and Cuban with the University of Melbourne, where he was a, a professor, professorial research fellow until the end of 2014. Now he's a professor in the School of Electrical and Data Engineering at the University of Technology, Sydney, and a member of the Global Big Data Technology Centre, where he runs the Timing Laboratory. <laughs> and you, it is the work that's come out of this Timing Laboratory that I'm sure you will all thoroughly enjoy. Okay, Daryl, over to you. Oh, yes, if you could, folks, if you could either put your questions into the chat, we will uh, punch them in, and, and we will we'll I'll put them either to Daryl along the way if we if they're earth shattering and need to to stop it, but otherwise we'll wait till uh, ten minutes to the hour before we put the last few questions through. Okay, then I think we can hand over to Daryl now. Go, Daryl. Um, yes, thank you uh, very much, Narelle, for the uh, invitation, and it's great to have the opportunity to um, to speak today uh, for the IIA audience. Um, can I trust my clock? So this talk is all about uh, internet timekeeping, and uh, so let's uh, get you straight in there. Get my cursor on the right screen. Um, what is internet timing? So it's it's a system to try to synchronize um, essentially more or less every computer on earth. It comprises uh, remote hardware and software and servers you can access over the network, um, the internet itself, 
Um, the network timing protocol, which is a protocol, specifies packet contents, etc. Local hardware in your computer, like uh, local oscillators, um, operating system support, and finally synchronization algorithms running user land. The system we have today, which is often called just NTP, we've got the protocol protocol itself. It's one of um, the IP, one of the internet's oldest IP protocols. And what it does is timestamp, uh, transports timestamps and status between um, clients and, and clock servers over UDP. Um, it also, this term, the NTP system, also really covers um, the synchronization algorithm it's, itself on uh, living in user land and the kernel components I'm um, connecting to it. And also refers to the way things are set up, um, in which is as a hierarchy anchored by the stroke called uh, Strata 1 servers. These are servers which have um, reference hardware such as atomic clocks or GPS are directly attached to them. Stratum 2s um, connect over the network to these stratum 1s, stratum 3s to stratum 2s and so on. And that's how we scale to synchronize everybody. So it, this is um, roughly how it should look. And we'll return to this figure uh, later on. We'll see it uh, doesn't always quite, quite work like this. So this system, we're all using it every day. And you know we have to say it's been a big, very big success. But um, it's my job in this area to be picky. Um, so let me talk about some of the, uh, the problems the system has. So number one, uh, trust. These servers, in particular Stratum 1 servers, um, we're basically trusting them. There's no oversight of them, neither from within the system nor external to the system. Um, and hosts, clients trying to use the system, um, trying to use those servers, cannot tell good service from bad. And research that I'll be summarizing for you later shows that there are indeed um, a lot of problems out there. And um, vulnerability, the Stratum 1 servers are the, are the core of the system. Uh, they are expensive, they're independent islands that can be overloaded, and they're overwhelmingly GPS based. And as we, as we now know, it's become very topical to talk about the vulnerability of space assets. So most of internet timing is uh, in a pretty vulnerable state from a, a number of different possible attacks. Uh, reliability and accuracy, the NTPD daemon, that's the clock synchronization algorithm, can lose stability um, and it's not very robust to disruptions, unfortunately. And path variability, um, because remember the packets are traveling over the internet, they're encountering a lot of congestion and the paths also change. That introduces uh, significant disruptions to the clock algorithm, which is not um, properly taken into account um, by the existing system. And finally, asymmetry awareness. Asymmetry is you know, whether the path from the client to the server or the reverse path are the same or not, in a certain sense. It's a major source of error, the fact that in general, you do not have path asymmetry. And that error is inherent, it's very difficult to remove, but it can be mitigated. Unfortunately, the existing system just ignores it, um, which means you condemn to suffer um, all the worst consequences. And this will be a theme I'll talk about a lot in the talk, this asymmetry question, it's a really important one. Impacts of getting things wrong, well, um, for applications where timing is really critical, um, what is done at the moment is to throw hardware at the problem. Um, hardware solutions are expensive, labor intensive to put in place. For example, if you want really reliable timing, you need to have, for example, GPS receivers that are roof mounted and are well maintained. And if they fail, they can fail catastrophically. Um, it may take a long time to replace that system on the roof. Um, network measurement, which is an area I come from, I'm a, I work in the, the network uh, measurement, internet measurement field. So much of the of the measurement data there that we're trying to exploit for all sorts of clever reasons um, consists essentially of the timestamps. They are the data. <clears throat> uh, distributed services, um, speed of light and being a finite quantity, um, how good in distributed services can be, cannot be, cannot be improved um, without limit simply by increasing CPU speeds or, or improving caching technologies. Fundamentally, latency has limits, and the only way to get around that is um, accurate synchronization. Uh, network infrastructure, pretty much everything we rely on nowadays is networked, as we know, and a lot of that has critical vulnerabilities um, with respect to timing. And of course, we have uh, particular applications that are um, extremely important where timing is absolutely critical as well. 
So what could go wrong with this system? Well, I'm not sure if you remember um, this film, but this was a, an interesting uh, heist story whereby a GPS feed was um, overridden and resulted in a major financial institution uh, losing a second over a period of time. And then in that special second at midnight, they tried to exploit the uh, thieves tried to exploit that to steal a large amount of money. Now, this is unlikely to go unnoticed in today's world, however, um, we might recall in the last few years we've had a couple of leap seconds, um, which are those extra seconds um, inserted into the UTC timescale to keep the Earth's rotation in sync um, with, uh, with linear time. And uh, we performed a, a bunch of uh, extensive measurements um, to track what, what some of the stratum one servers out there were doing during this time. And here is uh, some plots of some of the more extreme examples. Um, these are extreme, but I can show you many other examples which are not really dramatic like this, but nonetheless are very significant. What we should see in these plots is a, a sudden drop from zero down to minus one precisely at the zero here, which is when the leap second was meant to occur at midnight. Instead, we see all of these strange things, including delays to, uh, and a considerable time to finally settle down, or just craziness in some cases. And we did an even larger study in 2016, and we saw the same thing. So leap seconds are a bit, we received a lot of press recently because there actually there is a, a plan to ineffectively abolish them, although it's not quite that simple. Um, what we've seen in this last two leap second events is that they do cause a lot of problems and the servers aren't handling them properly. What I want to talk to you about in this talk is uh, the really uh, to go over the, the, the territory which I've covered in this area over going back a, a rather large number of years now. Um, the next part of the talk will be to write the timing background terminology necessary and that will involve a lot of talk about right clock, which is uh, uh, the thing, the, the approach that I've come up with to do better than the status quo. I need to explain that in some detail in order to explain the subsequent uh, results. And then I'll talk about sets of experiments oriented in ragtop performance, later on server performance, and then um, the, more, the exciting work that, that we're doing right now. So first, timing and ragtop background. Um, it's so critical in this game to keep track of a proper model, proper mental model, here we, we need to, to keep very distinct the idea of true time and what a clock might say. A clock is a construct, it could be arbitrarily wrong. So here our true time is this atomic, um, internationally agreed upon atomic, um, atomic scale, TAI. This is uh, our true time. A perfect clock, this black line, a perfect clock CP for perfect, would read TK at true time TK. Not surprisingly, it would be perfect. A clock which would be slight out simply by constant would be this green one. One which is going at, at the wrong rate would be this blue one. I'm gradually getting worse and worse as time progresses. And more, realistic, more realistically, we have this red curve, which shows how um, actual clock hardware uh, moves around, um, drifts away from uh, a simple model over time. Now, drift is very much driven just by temperature changes. Here is an example of that. This black line is um, a, a zoom in on some um, data I took a long time ago showing effectively this temperature generated drift that's what these uh, these oscillations are in the black line what the uh, the green is is is, not, is uh, raw data coming in um, in packets from a server and the blue line is uh, algorithms attempts to filter that green to approach the black and you can see that the blue does a pretty good job of um, cutting out the noise from the green and approaching the true um, underlying drift that's occurring, which can then be compensated for. And you notice the sort of gap between the blue line is, is a bit lower than the black line by a, it's a roughly constant amount. That's actually due to asymmetry. That is an asymmetry issue, not the actual clock synchronization issue. And I'll come back to that um, again and again, this asymmetry um, question. Um, here's, here's a point which is not very often discussed. We need different clocks for different needs. Um, if we had a perfect clock, which is perfect in all respects, then of course that's all you'd ever need. You'd use it for everything and everything would be perfect. Um, but that's in the real world, um, every system we have is imperfect. And so um, it makes sense to have to specialize in order to get the result that we want. So there are three fundamental need, ways, uh, uses for clocks. One is to determine event ordering. Now for this purpose, 
we can use hardware counter, which is like the fundamental underlying basis of time, but we could also just use message passing logic. And as long as we haven't screwed anything up, we can expect perfection out of the system. Our next, our next thing that talks are used for is to measure the duration of time intervals. Now for this, I have coined the term difference clock, by which I mean a clock specialized to be able to do that well, at least over short time intervals. This can also be based on a local hardware counter, timestamp exchange to remote reference in order to do a smart calibration of that of the period of that of that hardware counter. And if we do this well, we can expect an extremely robust, extremely accurate um, difference clock. The clock we normally think about is an absolute time clock. You know, we read the clock in a watch, we read it at the time on the UTC time scale. Um, this is a much harder job. To do this well, we need a more ideally a more stable hardware counter, more frequent exchanges with a remote reference, really smart calibration, and clever robustness design. And what we can expect out of this is something which is, should be sane, but nonetheless is much less accurate and more vulnerable than a difference clock. So um, these are, we need to keep these different specializations in mind. Uh, continuing on, uh, just a little bit of preparation of, of software clock fundamentals. We start off with some local hardware, um, a counter, for example, a hardware counter counting oscillations of a hardware oscillator on the motherboard. I use the term raw timestamp to mean reading that counter. It's an extremely important distinction between that raw timestamp and a timestamp coming from the final clock. Remember, the final clock is, is a complicated construct, it's software. It's subject to all sorts of delays, all sorts of bugs. It's, it's a complicated function. Underneath all of that are the raw timestamps. Now, we, one could take a scale, a counter and simply scale it so that it reads in seconds rather than tick units, um, but that is not a good clock. It would drift. The things are more complicated than that. The purpose of the clock synchronization algorithm is to correct for that drift. Here is a kind of picture of a network based um, clock sync. At, here we are at the client. We want to synchronize to a server somewhere else. At a given time, we uh, send a packet to the server. The server receives it at a later time and sends it back. So we have a forward and a return path. Forward delay here, reverse delay here. Add them together, we get round trip time. Subtract them and we get asymmetry. And here we see we can visualize asymmetry here. The two paths are not the same. So this, the raw data of these timestamps that we're collecting are both the client and the server. The key problem is, first of all, delay variability. Because of congestion in the network, delays are varying all over the place. It's the synchronization algorithm's job to eliminate that delay, that variability. This is, can be complex, but it is possible within limits. Path asymmetry is the fact that the, these, the, the paths are not the same. The underlying minimal delays in each direction are not the same. Correcting for that is, in a sense, fundamentally impossible, in fact. But it can be managed, it can be mitigated. And we'll talk more about that. So these, these are the fundamentals. RAG clock um, stands for robust, absolute, and difference clock, focusing, as I mentioned before, on the importance of separating out these two roles. Um, when it comes to time stamping, its focus is on those raw counter reads, not reading its finest final clock, but reading raw counter. Those reads are independent of the clock synchronization output, so you cut out an important source of feedback, which could create problems. It's a dual synchronization algorithm because it, it has maintains a distance clock and an absolute clock. And this clock reading is a very stateless operation. You take the raw timestamp and you compose it in a very simple way with parameters maintained by the algorithm. And this, this slide shows that same thing in more detail. So we read a count, for example, on, on Intel systems, the TSC register. So imagine a TSC counter is a nice choice because it's, uh, it runs at the rate of the CPU. So if you have a, a nanosecond, a gigahertz uh, processor, um, it ticks every one nanosecond, which is a nice low resolution. Um, the synchronization algorithm maintains these three parameters here, these three parameters. Uh, period is a long-term average period of the the account of the counter. K is a big fat constant to align you with the, the, the arbitrary agreed UDC time scale. And E is an estimate of an error in that under, naive clock, which you then subtract to get you the best clock that you can. So this is what you do in the absolute clock. You read the counter, scale it up to read in seconds, 
correct it to the right origin, and then remove the error. Compared to that, the difference clock, you see we just we removed this error term. So the difference clock um, is basically relies on the fact that drift will be small over a short period of time. And so by not trying to, um, to track two absolute time, time stamps, you effectively eliminate the hardest part in synchronization. You don't let that error, the errors in the E term, you don't let the errors in the errors um, pollute your estimate of the, of the clock period. It makes a huge difference. I'm going to just, this may seem a little bit abstract at the moment. I'm going to show you something very concrete uh, later on on this. Uh, just briefly on the implementation, uh, for time stamping support, we have kernel modifications for both FreeBSD and Linux to create a, a sufficiently wide 64-bit um, counter if one is not already available, and to make it available both to user LAN and kernel. Um, we have a user LAN raglog daemon, um, which is, connects two servers and makes use of those kernel timestamps, and then maintains those parameters which are available both to kernel and user land apps. And as I said before, the clock reading is in fact um, this very simple operation. So what do we get out of this rag clock approach? The fundamental thing is, of course, more accurate absolute timestamps. And here's just an, an indicative idea of what the, how much better they could be. It could be hundreds of microseconds only rather than milliseconds or many milliseconds. Um, more importantly, offers much higher robustness to network delays. It's much more uh, bulletproof. Beyond that, we have a difference clock, which under the existing NTPD paradigm does not exist at all. In the existing paradigm, you have access only to an absolute clock, which means you, it's the only one you've got. So if you want to measure a time difference in particular, that's what you're going to have to use, and then you, that will then inherit the, all the issues with an absolute time clock. Um, because we have a difference clock, if you want to now, if you want to measure short time intervals, so for example, a networking round trip times are very important. Um, we can measure round trip time intervals without a problem to sub microsecond, um, without the need for GPS. So if that's your use case, or delay variation, or inter, or into arrival times of packets, all of these difference type um, applications, this is a huge increase in robustness and accuracy for, with, with no cost, no associated cost. And we have more advanced capabilities as well. We can, we can store the raw timing data and replay it later on. So there are many ways in which this could be used. Uh, one interesting way is you could improve the clock algorithm and then retrospectively improve all the timestamps. And then change your mind and change them back. So that is the uh, the background of the timing and rack clock. I'm not sure, um, Narelle, if you wanted to open things up to questions at any point. And usually at this point, I would um, ask ask people if they had any questions on the on the timing part before continuing. I'm not seeing any questions come in as yet, Daryl. So I think keep going. Show us your measurements. They're really really interesting. <laughs> yes, I'm an interesting bit. Okay, here we go. So this first set of measurements are the kind of the first really long phase of this work. Um, we were really focused on proving that we really could do something so much better with rag clock. So these are measurements trying to prove up rag clock and compare it with NTPD. So these are measurements based in a single client, are connecting to a server across the network, and we almost always focus on the stratum one server across the network. Why? Because, well, we didn't, we wanted to do our comparisons in the client, but we didn't want to muddy the waters by also having a server that was doing strange things. So we choose, we choose reliable Stratum 1 servers to, um, so that we could at least trust the server. So um, here is one um, plot based on what we call an external comparison, which I'll talk to you more about on the next slide, comparing what the normal, um, um, the normal NTPD solution um, is a stratum two synchronizing to a stratum one, which is on the very same LAN, so it's very close by, compared to rag clock, which at the time was called TSC clock because it used the TSC register as its counter. Um, rag clock synchronizing also, synchronizing also to a stratum one, but outside the LAN. So we gave a bit of a disadvantage uh, to ourselves just, um, just for the hell of it. And this is an experiment over um, 42, 42 days. So I think you can, the plot kind of speaks for itself. We see uh, this very tight, very low variability 
in the red clock, GSC clock, um, whereas compared to um, the status quo. And this is the kind of result that we just saw um, again and again in over many experiments. Now, I really want to emphasize here that um, what I'm showing you here is the best behavior you can get out of NTPD. Um, we, we like to think of ourselves as being kind of the world expert to making NTPD behave well. Um, we spent a lot of time in, in really refining the methodology and, and constructing a repeatable framework um, so that when we got results, it wasn't going to be due to you know, particular unfortunate events, it would be something representative. And in the process, we became very good at making NTPD behave reproducibly. So this is really the best you'll ever see. It was a bit of also a bit of a one-upmanship on our part here. We wanted to prove that if we were better than the best that NTPD could possibly do, then we were certainly better than what it does in the wild, which can be much, much, much worse than this. Um, now, why should you trust me? Well, here's part, hopefully part of the reason. This is the experimental setup that we had at the time. We have our, our, strat, our local stratum one uh, white mushroom GPS receiver here, which was synchronizing into this host. This is where the experiments are running in the host on the left. So I would synchronize the clocks in here, both um, the NTP clocks synchronizing either um, to the GPS receiver all over, or over the network and the TC clock synchronizing over the network. We'll be talking to this uh, NTP server, stratum one server here we would siphon off packets by this hub so that we can make these independently timestamped packets using a very expensive DAG card, which is a high performance of packet capture card with hardware timestamping, also GPS synchronized. And that performs our, um, that provides our external um, objective reference for enabling us to, to pass judgments on the clock performance. Um, um, this experiment was over two days and um, it was one of the something which took a long time to put together, but um, I want to this tries to track compare performance between uh, rack clock and the, sta the, the status quo um, by systematically um, examining what happens um, when, depending as a function of some key parameters. We've got round trip time, essentially the server, essentially something very close on the left, something a bit further away in the middle and something a long way away, in this case from Melbourne to Perth. Um, on the right hand side, um, where a server near in this case was something like only one millisecond away. And as a function of polling period, which is the frequency at which you, you were sending out those, you having those time snapping changes with the server. So you see things repeated, the, the polling period here, and then the same experiment um, results for the rag clock. So these are in parallel, um, absolutely fair um, experiments, whereby exactly the same timing packets are being used for both clocks. Exactly the same packets are being used. Um, what are these funny lines? Let's look at this, this guy. Um, these are summaries of histograms. The black line is the median over all the results that were collected over, over the period. Um, the, the next two outer red lines are the interquartile range. Remember, that's from the 25th to the 75th um, percentile. And the whiskers are from the 2nd to the 98th percentile. So these lines are giving us a summary of the histogram, the spread of values that we're seeing. And the key, the main message that we're seeing here is that um, the whole the whole range here, from you know the second to the ninety eighth percentile for rack clock, is it will fit inside the interquartile range of the rack of the uh, NTPD. Now we um, and we had two yeah sorry sorry I'm being around there. there's a short time delay and I then I act too quickly I've got to slow down. Um, we redid this experiment a number of years later, quite a few years later, improving it in many respects that I haven't got time to go through, but we have completely new implementations, new kernel implementations, improved methodology, um, new servers, um, improved performance of both our clock and NTPD, um, and this time data collected over nine months. So this was really a huge effort to get these plots together, and we see that the, the basic message stays the same, that um, Red Clock's work gives this very tight performance um, fitting inside the intercortile range of the NTPD. So that was the absolute clock. Now I want to talk, give you, try to give you a result compare of the difference clock. Now this is actually really difficult to show because the difference clock is so accurate. It's really difficult to have a, a methodology which will actually demonstrate how accurate it is. So this plot shows you um, one aspect. It shows you some things, not everything. 
It doesn't actually tell us the accuracy of the difference clock, but it still has a couple of really important messages um, to deliver. So let me explain what it is. So we need to measure time differences for difference clock, right? So what we've done here is we've sent in, every two seconds we send in a packet. So it's a periodic packet stream. And both clocks are going to be measuring the interarrival time. So we're measuring a time difference. So each clock will be seeing roughly two seconds. And what we do is we subtract the two measurements. Each clock is measuring approximately two seconds. We subtract that to see the differences between the clocks. And that's what we're plotting here, the time series on the left and the histogram of it on the right. And we see that the histogram is, is basically it's all sitting within just a one microsecond difference. So they're agreeing very closely. Um, and as they should, because this is a stratum one clock. This is an NTPD operating in stratum one mode. It's got reference time stamping directly attached. Whereas rack clock does not. Rack clock is communicating over the network. Okay. Um, now, the system clock is returning time valve format, which has microsecond resolution limitation. So it's impossible to see below the microsecond anyway. So what we're seeing here is the clocks agree to within the resolution limit of the data structure, except we still these spikes here, see these nasty spikes. So we know with certainty, because we know the implementation, that um, those spikes are not due to rag clock, but they are due to the system clock. So the conclusion here is, despite the, well, that one microsecond limitation <laughs> that we have here, the conclusion here is that rag clock without the GPS is doing better than NTPD with the GPS. Now, from other measurements I can't show here, we actually know that the rack clock here is actually less than 0.1 of a microsecond without GPS. But wait, there's more. Um, what if at the beginning of this experiment, which as you can see is over 20 days long, what if we had accidentally unplugged the network, right? So our clocks, so that rack clock would not have been able to communicate over the network to its server. What would happen to these measurements? Well, let's take a look. It's the same time series, but this time, We've frozen the parameters at, from at the very beginning of the experiment, we've frozen the rack clock parameters, which is exactly what rack clock would do if in fact you had disconnected the network. It would simply not update the parameters. And you see that the results are very little different. You can see it's hard to see in the time series. You can see a slight difference in the histogram on the right. So this illustrates the robustness of, of the different clock. Remember, this is a rack clock. This is a synchronization algorithm connecting Across the network to a server. After some time, it is now disconnected from the server and for a period of 21 days, it's trying to measure an inter-arrival time and it's doing it with an error under a microsecond after being disconnected from its server for over 20 days no, at no cost, no GPS. Okay, so you know this is what we all should be using to measure um, time differences. Quick plot on NTPD robustness. Here's an example of where I think we see um, um, NTPD's error being measured here. It seems to be you know, very low at some point, and then suddenly it goes a little bit crazy and then goes okay again. What caused this? What's it due to? Well, actually, this is simply because um, we captured some packets. And that was enough to induce latency in, in the system clock. Um, which then made these clock measurements, uh, create, created these errors. Even though the clock, the clock should be completely unaffected by the fact that you're simply using it. <laughs> so here you dare to use the clock and, and, and suddenly its, its performance is degraded. Rack clock doesn't have it, that kind of behavior. This experiment is a, frac is a subset of something of a nine month experiment. So this, this the client oriented experiments um, I've covered there. It's a brief summary, but I tried to show you things which are really backed by very large data sets and very careful uh, methodology. Um, the next set of the work was to start turning the tables on the service. Uh, as I said before, we took pains before to select a, an, a reliable stratum one so that it, we wouldn't have to worry about it while we did our client side experiments. Now what we want to do is to trust our client side because we trust Racklock, but also because we have our DAG and GPS based infrastructure locally, and now use it to connect to multiple servers and to pass judgments on them to see what's happening out there in those servers. So we call the problem set server health message. Ironically, also known as a simple harmonic motion would be another, another interpretation of that acronym. Um, basically, the story is simple clients need to trust their servers, but servers can fail. So, how often does that happen? How to detect it? 
in the fact, given that the client is suffering from all the changes in the path to the server, network congestion, how can you disambiguate what's happening in the network from a server that may be a fundamental problem. But path asymmetry is, is the absolute key to how this can be done. So this is a figure that you saw before, and just reminding you that we have these um, minimum one-way delays in the um, two and reverse directions. If we add them together, we get around underlying asymmetry. I call it underlying because remember, this is the minimum underlying value without congestion. Okay, underlying value. And this R is the minimum RTT with no congestion, which we try to measure in practice. The detection principle is this. If a server has an error of size E, then asymmetry changes by 2E. So by examining changes in asymmetry, we can, in principle, detect server errors. So let's go through that, look at that in more detail. So here is um, the next few slides show you, shows you how this works. In each case, we're going to have a round trip time up top, plot up top, and asymmetry um, down below. We're seeing the per packet results here, but this black line is a, a simple um, median, sliding median filter, which just helps you keep your eye, keeps your eye in the tracking what's happening um, overall. Tries to cut it. It's a really nice way to cut through the congestion in an informal way. We see that in this plot, nothing much is happening. RTT seem is consistent with an unchanged minimum RTT and, and the, the asymmetry consistent with it an unchanged um, underlying asymmetry of some value. Okay. Later on in this time series, we see now suddenly RTT has undergone this level shift. So this is this very clear, distinct signature that we see all the time indicating that the path has changed. But when we look at asymmetry, we see we don't see any change at all at that time instant. This is because the change in the routing occurred um, exact, exactly equal and opposite way in each direction at once. And so we see nothing in asymmetry. So this is one possible scenario. Here's another one. This time RTT drops, and this time asymmetry drops by exactly the same amount. This is because a change in path occurred in one direction only. But then later on it drops again. That's because now a change occurred in the other direction, in the same direction, where now asymmetry is jumped down, but then later on jumped back up to where it was. This is another scenario of what we might see. But here, so here we're seeing a change in asymmetry, but that doesn't imply there's anything wrong with the server. Right? We can understand why this occurred because of the change in path. Okay, so again, there's no, no anomaly in this case. Oops, sorry, it's happening. Here we are. In this case, what do we see? RTT again, sorry. RTT, nothing much happening, as we saw before. And so in particular, we know there are no significant changes in routing. We know there is no major congestion. What's happening in asymmetry? Well, despite that, there's a huge amount happening here. Look, these are tens of, millise tens of milliseconds here. Here, there are only single milliseconds. So essentially, these changes cannot be due to routing. They cannot be due to congestion, be due to the server. But we call these server anomalies. Sorry. And uh, here is another example of server anomalies, much smaller in magnitude now, only one or two milliseconds. They're very distinct, very clear. This should be flat line with noise on top. What we're seeing here are consistent, ongoing changes over many days, and in fact, years of this behavior. We call this form skew and return, because it kind of skews and then resets back. Another kind of um, example, again, this is from a server exhibiting errors for continuously, basically. Um, this shape is more of a form of a clock which is um, drifting and then occasionally gets corrected. So there are different kinds of anomalies that we observe. Um, so we were really interested in this, so we performed, um, um, we, we made use of an existing earlier data set that we collected in 2011, augmented another data set, each one you know, quite a long data collection period, and then finally a much bigger um, experiment later on, a few years later again, this time covering several hundred servers. And what we found is we were able to get um, 102 of these stratum on servers, which are actually in common across these two experiments, and that gave us a great opportunity to um, come up with a longitudinal study to see how performance um, was changing over time. 
This is the test bed used for that. It's kind of more advanced than the previous one. This one is the test bed I have at UTS. The previous one was at the University of Melbourne. Um, now we have a, an atomic clock as well as a GPS. We used the GPS to stabilize the atomic clock on, on longer time scales. Um, this RS-422 signal synchronized the DAG cards and we have a, a MAC clock FreeBSD running here with uh, no low latency taps, tapping off the signals, um, low balancing over these two clients. Um, and then sending out to um, 479 servers outside the network. And by the way, all the all the MATLAB data and and all the full set of the experiment three data plus MATLAB software to analyze it in, in gory detail is available at this link. <clears throat> so um, we do, of course, have a whole detailed paper <laughs> telling you about the results. I can only come up with some uh, main findings here. Tell you about some main findings here. Errors are widespread. Of all the servers um, we looked at, 84% were caught being in error at least once. Um, and sometimes they were very rare errors. And in some cases they were very rare and very small. So it doesn't mean they're horrible servers. But in other cases, they were rare but large. In other cases, um, not rare but small. In other cases, not rare and not small. Everything. And I'll show you an example of that on the next slide. 26% of the errors of those in error were of type H, which basically means permanently in error, like I showed you earlier. Errors are significant. Over 31% of errors um, of servers which had errors had errors over 100 milliseconds. Okay. Now remember, these are supposed to be the stratum ones, right? These are the, these are the servers that are anchoring the system. Okay. Server behavior seems to be remarkably consistent over time. You know, here we actually showed three experiments, each one years apart, and if, what we found is if a server was doing badly in 2011, it was still doing badly in 2017. And um, disturbingly, many national servers, sorry, maintained by national laboratories are also in error. And in fact, um, <clears throat> seven of them in our list have the errors we call of H type, which means basically um, essentially continuous. And these, this is just a small section from one of the tables in the paper where the, these colored servers here are from NIST, that's the standards body in the US. And many of their servers um, in each of the experiment one, two, and three um, were showing these high prevalence errors. The anomalies we found had this incredible diversity. If we could just um, focus on the left hand plot here for the R, these are the rare servers. These are servers which have uh, just a small number of errors. Um, I just want to draw attention to the, the orders of magnitude here. This goes from 10 to the minus 1 milliseconds to 10 to the 6. That's the amplitude of the error and uh, of a representative error. And the durations from um, 10 to the 0 to 10 to the 6 seconds. Right? So that's you know, from one second to weeks. Right? So there's an unbelievable um, variety of, of stuff that you can see out there. And the same for the C class, which is you know, more than rare, but not H. And H is the you know, errors almost all the time class, where most of them have errors indeed 100% of the time up here. Um, error estimation, how does that work? Um, we have a rigorous method to measure that, which took quite a long time uh, to develop. Um, however, the detection itself, that disambiguation of, am I looking at an error? Am I looking at you know, something in the path? Um, that can be very complicated. Um, and we haven't yet, not yet got a, you know, a method I'd be happy with, and that's automated that can do that. There's a lot of manual work involved in isolating these um, server anomalies at the moment. And this is work, uh, this is what we're part of the direction for future work is to automate the whole thing. It's not easy. Um, because we are tracking path conditions, and this, I think this is really exciting because um, pretty much no one else has ever done this. Because we are actually bothering to track those changes in path, we are in a position to be able to detect um, periods of time where there are no changes in the path. And, then within those, and that means within those periods of time, the minimum RTC and the underlying asymmetry are meaningful. Like they, they, they exist, it can be measured, and we have the means to measure it in this experiment. And therefore, we can plot actual values, reliable values of asymmetry. And that's what we've done here. We're actually plotting relative asymmetry. You normalize with the minimum RTT, so the answer is going to be in between minus 1 to 1. Here we have um, these circles represent um, a particular um, clear zone interval where we've made a measurement. And the same color, when, it comes, when the circle is the same color, 
it comes from the same server. So for example, we see this blue line here, very dense here, and then it gets thinner out here. This line of blue or corresponds to what we see from a single server as, a, as this path jumps around. And every time this path changes, we make a new measurement of asymmetry and plot them here. And we see it forms these interesting structures, which are telling us about the, how the path is behaving. But this kind of view of what is asymmetry really doing out there and what does it look like is basically uh, unique. I don't think anyone else can show you a plot like this. And now I want to talk about the, uh, the, the fun stuff that we are we're doing right now. And I'm going this to- This is a, a five minute time check, Daryl. Right, oh dear, oh dear. Okay, here we go. So <laughs> what we want to do is create a perfect system. Is an important step to that. We want to reimagine the core. At the moment, as I, as a moment, what do we have? We have a system, a hierarchical system, supposed to look like this, but in reality, it looks more like this, um, with too many servers talking directly to Stratum One, and we have the, we have this you know, independent forest. And what happens if one server goes wrong? The whole tree under it goes wrong. So we want to do better than that. Um, this is the basic architecture of this NTC. It consists of some uh, inner core nodes in the center here, which are stratum ones. Outer core nodes, which synchronize to the inner core nodes, they serve customers. And a trust node in the middle, which plays the role of an in-house auditor. Now the outer core nodes are stratum ones by definition, but not, they're not ordinary stratum ones, stratum two, sorry. That's why I call them two plus. And the trust node has its own reference timekeeping with um, atomic clock, et cetera, that I've shown you. It is at one level just another strata one, but in fact, it does much more than that. Some of the key features of this, these OCNs are the public face. They serve customers where the others and others do not. This has a number of advantages listed here. The ICNs, the inner core nodes have no NTC software. They're just normal strata ones. So this is this huge advantage. It means that we can co-opt stratum ones and we can encourage stratum one providers to participate in an NTC. They're never going to do that. If we said, oh, we'll just adopt our software, oh, there'll never be any problem. Don't you worry. They'll never do it. This means that we can make use of the expensive stratum ones out there. Because this is the whole point. We want to take expensive stratum ones and leverage them to create a core, which is inexpensive, but very reliable. No OCN to OCN communication. We want to keep it simple. To reduce complexity and very weak coupling between the trust node and those outer core nodes. The trust node is meant to provide trust and internal auditing. It's not meant to be part of a distributed system, which, which would then become a, a single point of failure. And finally, the packet flows are standard NTP request responses. We don't have, we can do all of this without having to invent a new protocol, which would, which would be very complicated. We would have all sorts of you know, new attack surfaces that would need to be examined and so on. A bunch of details there I haven't got time to go into. But these are the key features. And, and coming back to the figure, except my arrow is not key, it's not working. Something. Okay, now it's coming back up. I don't know why that happened. It's a little large figure. Coming back to the figure. We see, maybe understand this a bit better now, we have this OCN here, which is not talking to other OCNs, but it is talking to each and every one of the inner core nodes, and it is not talking, not synchronizing to the trust node. Now there's a secret source here. The outer core nodes are stratum twos, but they're not just any stratum two. And one important reason why they're special is that we have this insight. If we can, sorry that happened, every time I just exit, just touch something, Things disappear. I have to keep my hands to myself so that won't happen. Um, the um, part of the what the OCNs have, which is special, is an ability to track asymmetry. Now that, that can show you asymmetry changes, but it can't tell you what the actual asymmetry is. But if we can couple this with a one-off calibration so that we know what asymmetry is at a point in time, followed by accurately tracking it, then we know asymmetry for all time. And then these stratum two OCNs become like stratum ones, but without having to pay for the cost of it. So this is a part of the secret source, which will make this entire system behave like an expansion of the inner core, but without the cost. 
we have a test bed running this. It consists of um, four OCNs um, in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Perth, inner core nodes, um, which are the stratum one nodes from the National Measurement Institute. They are whitelisted and not open to the public, but they are open to us. And why are they willing to let us use it? Well, first and foremost, because we just use them as they are. We're not asking them to run um, potentially dangerous software on their boxes. We have Telegraph, Postman Plus, Plus Grafana based telemetry, Ansible based command and control. And the, the workhorse nodes here, the OCN nodes and the trust node, these are rack clocks, but rack clocks with some special additional um, bits of software, which are also under development. And the trust node uh, performs the server health monitoring, but keeping an eye on all the nodes. The trust node is using the other nodes as servers in that framework of you know being able to turn the tables and to pass judgment on servers, keeping an eye on both all, all the inner core nodes in order to make sure that they are indeed trustworthy because we're relying on them, and the outer core nodes because that is the service that's been provided by the system. Now a demo is running continuously live, and I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, just a slide here pointing out that um, it's work, more work that needs to be done. And some resources, I just want to flag that if you're interested in development, um, please get in contact me with me here for the Rack Clock and NTC code base, which is in C. We have this website here with lots of papers and downloads, um, some talks here that you could be uh, interested in. And now the, uh, the quick demo. So this is a picture of a dashboard for a call, it's called NTC Central, which is like a central summary of what is happening across the um, across the test bed. The nice thing about this test bed is it's constantly running, so I can do a demo at any time um, because it's always on. Uh, makes it particularly easy to come up with a, a demo. Um, just briefly, what do we have here? We have uh, disk usage over here, so we're keeping an eye on all the four OCNs and also the trust node. Um, this tells us if the if the if the OCNs have been switched on to serve serve packets at the moment. At the moment, Brisbane is um, is being is allowed to serve the public, but the others are not. Um, here we have. Um, and these plots are status bid plots and this one's for Sydney let's focus on that um, no sorry this one's for Melbourne let's focus on that this is a bunch of um status bits the most which the most important actions that red clock takes um that we can summarize here in the form of various status bits if you see nothing it means the bit is not set so this should be sparse and what we see here is a uh, lots of activity here because at that point I restarted um that Melbourne OCN and that, that gives rise to a bunch of activity. For example, when it first starts, it declares itself as unsynchronized, and that's what that red dot is down at the bottom. And the orange represents a warm-up period, which occurs for quite some time after something is restarted. And the red at the top um, represents the fact that it, the clock has itself recognized that its time is strangely inaccurate and should not be, um, at the moment, it, um, information does not trust has come in and has been flagged with that red status bit. Whereas the purple just represents a normal updating of period estimates. So we have one of these plots for each of the servers here. And the plots that are shown are of these. Remember, each OCN is synchronizing to multiple inner core nodes. And for each one, there's an associated clock. And there's a, pro a preferred clock is selected. That's the one that will serve customers. And this is the one whose status is being shown in these plots here. And which one is preferred? This plot here tells us um, which clock is being preferred. So we see that for the Melbourne outer core node is preferring clock two, which happens to be the Melbourne inner core node most of the time, but on rare occasions, it changes its mind and decides instead to make use of, to serve customers with the, um, with the Adelaide inner core node. And why does it do that? It does that because it is being warned that there is a server anomaly in the Melbourne um, occasionally this one here, this dot here, is a server anomaly that's been detected in the inner core Melbourne node. That information is transmitted to the OCNs. And if you happen to be synchronized into that, that will cause the algorithm to switch off from that server and to choose another one. And that's, and that's what we're seeing here. I haven't got time to talk about it, but this is um, now a picture just focusing on OCN Sydney, 
we have um, in more detail everything that's happening in Sydney, including each detail on each of the underlying clocks. These are the minimum RTT plots. We see that very little is happening because we don't see congestion because these show the algorithm's estimate of minimum RTT, which we actually want to be um, as unchanging as possible, ideally never changing. And, um, and here the underlying asymmetry similarly does not often change. So that uh, will conclude my presentation. Thank you, Daryl. I really want to get to these questions because they're absolutely fascinating. And I have to thank um, Paul and, and David for being so, so patient with them. I'll run through some of them because I think you've actually answered some of these questions in the course of your talk. The first one that came in was from Paul, and he said, have you made any measurement comparisons with CRONID and NTPD minus RS, which both use different algorithms to classic NTPD? So have you had a chance to look into those other alternatives? Actually, Daryl, you can pull up the questions there as well if I'm miss... Um, sure, under the chat. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you should be able to see them. But basically, have you, have you done any comparisons with other algorithms to classic NTPD? Um, we've done some comparisons with a software implementation of PTPD. That was quite some time ago. Um, I haven't compared against CRONID. I only looked at that briefly a while, a while ago. I, I'm actually quite fuzzy, actually, in what it even is at the moment. So, no, the answer is no. Yeah, and Paul's other question was, are there any more recent measurements or can we make our own? Things in the wild generally improved quite a lot since 2007, but I think you then went through and showed us some of your more recent measurements. Um, yeah, Paul, you, uh, Daryl, you've been uh, measuring this for 20 years and that's just amazing. <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, it is a temptation to always want to do, you know, a new measurement campaign because things may have changed, but... Um, we also need to move on to other topics and having spent you know many many years kind of proving the performance of rack clock it's time to you know move to all the other topics and, and now we're really focusing on that system-wide problem but i think um, you've also demonstrated that not much actually really has changed through your different measurements over the years now paul's other next question was does the fact that this experiment used exactly the same packets on the wire mean that rad clock could be made wire compatible with ntp uh, and then he says, under the NTP version 5 work going on in the IETF, it's likely that we will see the wire protocol and the internal algorithm in separate standards to allow algorithm pluggability. That sounds amazing. I'm really, yeah. Any thoughts on that? Um, I, I presume that by wire compatible, you mean that not actually changing the NTP protocol itself. Um, that's certainly the approach that we've taken. I was, um, yeah. at the moment, we have, with, the, with, the, with one minor issue, with one minor exception that um, within the NTC, which would not affect public serving at all, it's only like an internal thing. Um, but that, with, with that minor exception aside, and we've always used completely standard um, NTP request response. I have no intention of expanding the NTP protocol itself at this, at this point. And my, my concern was always this should be extremely um, easy to deploy. And it is, you could adopt Red, Red Clock as a client and connect to any arbitrary NTP server, or you could um, establish an NTP uh, Red Clock server and then other clients, normal clients, connect to it in exactly the same way they normally do and it'll be unaffected. And you could deploy an NTC and have either Red Clock or normal clients you know, connecting to the NTC to serve time, again, over the same usual NTP protocol without a problem. Uh, so Craig then asks, how does it compare to PTP? which generally wants supporting hardware along the path. Right, so um, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> um, PTP is not an, an algorithm, it's just uh, a protocol. So um, in the early days of PTP, it was, or it was complete hardware support was assumed. So the, the protocol is just you know, exchanging messages and all of the hard stuff is done in hardware. Um, basically, the key assumption, the assumptions were perfect asymmetry, essentially zero delay variability. In other words, the set of assumptions with clock synchronization is completely trivial. Um, as soon as you get into a regime where you have latency and the internet, of course, is hell after latency, then all of that falls apart. And we had, um, we did have some papers published quite some time ago now demonstrating how badly it falls apart. I'm sure things have moved ahead since then. I know there's been more work in trying to provide a more cost-effective way, some additional hardware support in the Ethernet world for PTPD. And of course, it's possible now to, to expand the reach of PTPD further in, in that way. 
Um, the goal of our work was always to produce something in software only, which would be as good as the full hardware solution or partial hardware solution. I think we can we can do that. I it, it seems to be really going taking us a great a long way forward here, um, Daryl. Really does. And Paul's final question here is. Is the packet capture induced variability affected by multi-core versus single-core CPUs? Um, no, it, it shouldn't be. The implementations we have in both um, FreeBSD and Linux are based in, in the BPF um, subsystem, so it should be an abstraction above um, a cores. Um, we, what we have is something which is alongside of, it doesn't interfere with the existing system clock. In the case of FreeBSD, we've gone much further. What we have is a significant expansion of the actual um, system clock code, which is hopefully going to be fully um, accepted into FreeBSD kernel uh, in the not too distant future. It's been oh, partially yeah. since 2010. Um, it, it involves having, in addition to the feedback clock in the kernel, uh, feed forward clock, um, which rag clock would be the you know, canonical daemon, user land daemon for such a feed forward clock. And which means that in the kernel, you have simultaneously the feedback and the feed forward clocks always running. And then you, you can configure which one you actually want to use to serve a system time. And it, it also involves um, enhancements to how packet time stamping is done, which enables uh, um, perfect comparison and sharing of raw time stamps. Wow. So for packet, for packet time stamping, you would be able to have a shared um, raw timestamp and associated clock data, state data. And then in user land, you would be able to use that to get any kind of time stamp you want. You'd be able to specify if you want feedback or feed forward, you'd be able to specify um, what kind of um, resolution that you'd want to get back. You'd be able to specify if you want a different stock flavored feed forward clock or an absolute flavored feed forward clock, you can kind of get whatever you want. Incredible. And the final comment, the final one here is, uh, it's a question to me, <laughs> and it, it's a comment to you, Daryl. Awesome talk. Thanks very much. And thanks, Narelle IA, for organising. Will the slides be shared? Yes, they will. And the, this video will be going up onto our website in the not too distant future. So it then comes to my duty, given that there don't seem to be any more questions. And thank you so much for all those great questions, folks, uh, that we a huge thank you to Daryl for doing this again for us online. We really, really appreciate it. And we really appreciate you actually doing the work itself. So please keep up this, this good work. It's, it's, um, I think it's, it's really valuable for the internet community as a whole. Uh, a reminder then, folks, we've got those in-person events coming up in Canberra and Sydney on the 18th of July and the 20th of July. They'll be on our website. Um, I don't think I've got anything else I need to say other than a huge, huge, huge thank you to Daryl. Clap, 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 clap. I can't clap because I'm... Yeah, thank you, Daryl. <laughs> thanks to everyone for tuning in. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, so I think we're done here. I'm sorry we've gone a little bit over time, but let's just blame NTP for that, shall we? <laughs> blame me, <it's> okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Rita, I think you could keep...